Okay, here's a predict the products problem. Let's draw what the product would be here. So again, I'm going to use the uh, redraw and modify technique. So we're simply expected to have memorized that these are the reagents that form Grignard reagents. We should simply have a phone. Halogen and magnesium. Yeah, I think it would work with chlorine as well. So bromine uh, or chlorine. I think iodine too. So those three halogens are ma and magnesium would give you a Grignard um, reagent. Um, all right, these are the reagents. By the way, uh, usually uh, we might use, say, the solvent here might be, say, an ether. Ether is good solvent here. Uh, again, you don't want to use any one protic. You don't want to use a protic solvent. Uh, we'll see why in a second. All right. Um, you are not expected to know the mechanism for this reaction. Don't worry about the mechanism here. So it should be very easy to draw the product. This is what's called an insertion reaction. We simply insert the magnesium between the bromine and the carbon. You simply insert the magnesium between the bromine and the carbon. So where the bromine used to be, I'm going to insert the magnesium and we're not going to worry about what the mechanism is. So you simply erase the halogen and replace it with the halogen connected to the magnesium, uh, and that's what a Grignard looks like. So this is, uh, so you guys were asking me if there's any important reactions we haven't gone over yet. Well, this is a crucial reaction we haven't gone over yet. You're pretty sure to need this on the test. Last time we talked about what you can do with Grignards, but you also need to know how to make them. So this is how we would make a Grignard. What did you give us for this one? Just the starting material and the... Yeah, so all I gave you was this stuff. This was a predict the products problem. This was a predict the products. Um, uh, you, you're given these two things, so you just need to have the flashcard for this, uh, that this is going to give us a great yard. Okay? All right. Was lithium, would it be the same? Uh, how do you make an alkyl lithium? Yeah, so you should also know how to do that. I don't remember that as well, but I think it's like this. Maybe we should double yeah, check that. Like I think that's the reaction. Oh, here it is, here it is on the handout, maybe. So. Okay, so you should also know how to make an alkyl lithium. But it's not too important because um, the main reason you might have to come up with this, again, is if you're doing your own synthesis. Well, if you're doing your own synthesis, why not just stick to the Grignards? Right. Memorize how to do the Grignards. But just in case, you might, give, you, may, you might be given to predict the products here. If you were given to predict the products, you'd have to know this is going to make an alkyl lithium. Notice that um, there's a couple differences here. One difference is that in an alkyl lithium, the halogen does not stick around on the carbon chain. Alkyl lithium, the halogen does not stick around, whereas in a Grignard, the halogen does stick around. That's just something to be memorized. We're not going to explain why that is. Um, and so that's why you need two lithiums here. You need one lithium to attach to the carbon chain and replace the halogen, and you need the other lithium to balance out the halogen that's leaving. So the other, uh, the other lithium here is just balancing out this halogen uh, that's leaving here. Uh, this, this would be a good ionic bond because lithium is in the first column and bromine is a halogen. So these are the types of things that it's good to draw as if, as if they were ionically bonded. So this is how you make an alkyl lithium. That's a very logical name, right? Alkyl lithium because we have an alkyl group and a lithium. Um, and what's the name of this? Grignard. So a Grignard is a carbon chain, magnesium, and a halogen. But both of these react pretty much exactly the same. So for synthesis, you might as well just stick to Grignard since this is a slightly more complicated synthesis, okay? All right, um, so going back a step, why should we not use a protic solvent here? What would go wrong if we did this in water? It would... Yeah, I think... Who would protonate? H2O, because it's acting as an acid? No, just kidding. 
I think you guys still might be confused about what the words protonate and deprotonate uh, mean. Um, Let's we'll stop and think about that. So here's our grid yard, but we talked last time about how you actually should not draw grid yards like this. How would we actually draw this grid yard? Ionically. Yeah, so let's draw this uh, ionically. Let's go ahead and do that. some trouble with that, so let me help you with that. We didn't really talk about that enough last time. Um, who's the ionic bond between? Mg and the carbon. Yeah, it would be logical to think it's between the Mg and the Br, but it's not. It's between the Mg and the carbon. We briefly mentioned last time, you should almost just ignore the halogen here. The halogen is not doing anything. It's just forming a unit with the magnesium. The only role of the halogen here is to confuse us. Um, uh, this is just a unit here. So this would be the correct way to draw this. There's, uh, we treat this bond between the carbon and the magnesium as an ionic bond. Uh, and that would put a negative charge here and a positive charge here. And we just treat this like a single cation of magnesium and bromine. The bromine is not going to do anything in the reaction. So again, I think that was something that was confusing us here. Remember, the bromine is not going to do anything in any reactions. And neither is the magnesium. This is just a counter ion. All the action is on this negative charge on this carbon over here. Uh, okay, uh, so that would give us uh, that uh, over here. Now another big, huge mistake people tend to make here is changing the number of carbons. You have to be very careful. A lot of people would draw this like this. It's a hugely common mistake to draw the grid yard like this. It's so tempting to put the negative charge over here. It's hugely tempting, but that doesn't make sense because there are no carbons over here, right? There are no carbons here, so you really got to inoculate yourself against that mistake. The safest thing is to number the carbons. If you number the carbons, it's impossible to add or drop carbons. And if you don't number them, it's very easy to add and drop carbons uh, accidentally. So this would be wrong. Um, this is the wrong uh, green card over here. OK? Uh, all right. So um, anyway, how would this guy react with water? It would stabilize it because it doesn't want to be a carbon cation. No, I'm just kidding. No, the, oh, Who's interesting here? Who's the, the interesting the atom? Carbon, the, negative carbon. the negative carbon. We got to focus on the charge. What does this negative carbon want to do with the water? Take the hydrogen. hydrogen. Say again. Take yeah, it wants to take a hydrogen. That is, um, it wants to protonate, deprotonate the water, and protonate itself. Uh, because what, something with a negative charge can be either a nucleophile or a base. Something with a negative charge can be either a nucleophile or a base. So this would tend to deprotonate this uh, over here. But what would be the product if we deprotonated this water? OH and minus and a carbon on the third, on the third. And a hydrogen on the third. And what would be the name of that compound? Just Hydroxide? No, well, hydroxide. yeah, there would be hydroxide, but we're more interested in the organic oh. compound. So it would be propane, right? Yeah. It would just be a normal, boring propane. The only thing that's at all interesting about this is the negative charge. And if it protonates, it's going to lose the negative charge, and it'll just be propane. You may or may not draw the hidden hydrogen on there. That's up to you. Well, this is probably not what we wanted to do, right? We wanted to do something more exciting with this grid yard than just protonate it here at this step. So we talked about this a little last time, but maybe, uh, we didn't emphasize it enough. You got to keep grid yards away from protic solvents. Why do you have to keep grid yards away from protic solvents? Because the protic solvent will protonate um, the grid yard, unless you want to protonate it. Every once in a while, you want to put a hydrogen in. So if our, if our big goal in life is to make propane, then this would be a great way to go. If your goal is to make propane, then it would be great to add the water. Um, but usually, you want to do something more interesting uh, with the grid yard. Okay, so that's important to, uh, to keep in mind here. So when you're forming the grid yard, you don't want to do it in water because it would immediately commit suicide as soon as you made it. Um, so you want to do it in an aprotic solvent, like an ether, um, which uh, doesn't have uh, any uh, protons that this is likely to, uh, to pick up.
Okay, so let's talk some more about Grignard. This is likely to be an important topic on the test, and we haven't really uh, covered this carefully enough. So has what I said so far made sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, all right, let's draw the product of this reaction in its most useful, let, let's draw the most useful picture of the product of this reaction. This is predict the products. We want to draw the product in, in the most useful way that we can. 